Tonight, state capitals across the country are on alert. From Wisconsin to Texas to Washington State, more officers on patrol in Michigan. State Senator Sylvia Santana has kept a bulletproof vest in her office ever since far-right extremists crowded into the Capitol here last April to protest COVID lockdown restrictions. There was no violence, but... I was scared for my life. I'm just going to be honest with you. When you have people who are sitting up in the gallery with AR-15s, that is very frightening for anyone who's trying to do their job. Months later, several men would be indicted for an alleged plot to kidnap Michigan's governor. No person may carry a firearm in the public. On Monday, a commission banned open carry of firearms at the Michigan Capitol, though concealed carry is still allowed. Michigan's attorney general said today, I repeat, the Michigan Capitol is not safe. Though mostly peaceful pro-Trump protests unfolded at state houses last week, Online, there's new chatter of armed marches by the anti-government, pro-gun boogaloo movement, which aims to provoke a second civil war. If there's any type of disorder, uh, we will have the reinforcements there. Tonight. Intimidation by design. The Texas State Capitol building today resembled an armed camp. Workers in Madison, Wisconsin, boarded up ground floor windows of the state legislature. It is not safe for members of the public to gather at the Capitol. In Washington state, skittish lawmakers moved online. Outside, a man carrying an AR-15 screamed at media members. We're done with them, we're done with you. This image, widely trafficked online, urges an armed march on all state capitals January 17th. The worry? Violence could be more widespread than battleground states in the crosshairs of protesters for weeks. And it goes beyond state capitals. It goes to government facilities, federal facilities, city halls across the country. Last month, several dozen protesters breached the Oregon State Capitol building, angry about COVID restrictions. Armed protesters invaded Michigan's legislature last May, now banned there, openly carrying weapons inside but concealed carry is still allowed. Lawmakers everywhere have to adjust. Had a rush to reopen after a surprise move by the state lifting the month-long stay-at-home order for the greater Sacramento region, letting people dine outdoors once again. You know, we're happy to see this small semblance of uh, normalcy and the economy starting to open again. I know a lot of families and people have really suffered through this. The move impacts 13 Northern California counties and the roughly 3 million people who call them home. Greater Sacramento region is the first in the state to be cleared from the stay-at-home order. The state announcement came as a surprise for regional counties. And, you know, they're looking forward to this, but they say, well, this is a step in the right direction. They're warning residents tonight to not let their guard down. There is light at the end of this tunnel. A month into Sacramento's regional stay-at-home order, businesses are seeing some relief. Governor Newsom announcing today some restrictions have been lifted, effective immediately. We're starting to see some stabilization both in ICUs as well as stabilization in our positivity rate. ICU capacity in the greater Sacramento region remains below 15 percent despite operating at 9.4 percent ICU availability. State officials are telling county leaders the decision is based on future projections. Looking at the projection out four weeks and anticipating that we will be above 15% ICU bed capacity, and uh, they are thinking that the Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's surge is we're seeing the worst of it and it's getting better. Counties will go back to their respective tiers based on infection rates. For Sacramento and Yuba County, that means the most restrictive tier. Purple. It shows that we're, we're moving in the right direction, although our own hospital still doesn't have any available uh, ICU beds as of today. So we're still struggling locally. So what does this change? Outdoor dining and wineries are available, as well as outdoor worship services and indoor personal care services like hair and nail salons. Despite this, Yuba Sutter County officials say they are at a critical stage with 71 COVID patients hospitalized and 112 confirmed cases reported today. The community can't let up just because they see this move from the... Uh, from the stay-at-home order to the purple tier, because the purple tier is purposefully still very restrictive. Also this, Chad Wolf, the acting Secretary of Homeland Security, says 
He's resigning just hours after he stepped up security in Washington, putting the Secret Service in charge of a national security special security event a week ahead of Mr. Biden swearing in. In a bulletin sent to law enforcement today, the FBI warns extremists are calling for demonstrations, some armed, and storming federal, state, and local courthouses if President Trump is removed from office early. Every FBI office is now focused on preventing a repeat of last week's takeover of the U.S. Capitol. Agents are poring over more than 40,000 digital tips, including photos and videos. And this new angle, which appears to show rioters clashing with police officers with anything they can grab, the pull of an American flag, even a crutch, and beating a police officer. These officers were fighting. They were fighting for hours to protect that Capitol. Uh, I saw officers get hit with fire extinguishers. Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sund, who has since resigned, tells CBS News that during the attack, he repeatedly asked the Pentagon to send National Guard troops. I needed boots on the ground, immediate assistance right then and there, helping to form police lines to help secure up the foundation of the United States Capitol building. They were more concerned with the optics. The Pentagon says it did not deny Sun's request. During the assault, some protesters chanted, hang the vice president. More than 100 protesters have been arrested. These two accused of bringing restraints, including plastic zip ties that can function as makeshift handcuffs. One of them, Larry Brock, is an Air Force veteran. Others arrested face a variety of charges, including well-known protesters Jake Angeli, known as QAnon Shaman, and Adam Johnson seen carrying the speaker's lectern, and this unidentified man waving a Confederate flag. The timeline is also coming into focus. Protesters started violently pushing their way onto the grounds of the Capitol building around 1 p.m. Inside, lawmakers were preparing for a joint session of Congress in the House chamber to count the electoral votes. About an hour later, the Capitol was breached. This video shows lawmakers on the other side of this door as a rioter punches through and breaks the glass. Vice President Pence was pulled from the Senate chamber at approximately 2.14. By 2.17, our producer inside confirmed the Senate chamber was locked down. Law enforcement bulletins obtained by CBS News show that earlier as the president addressed the rally, pipe bombs were discovered at the Republican National Committee and Democratic National Committee headquarters. The FBI bulletin alerting law enforcement across the country that armed protests are being planned at all 50 state capitals through Inauguration Day. Intelligence pointing to an unnamed armed group calling for the storming of government buildings and courthouses if President Trump is removed before January 20th. The FBI saying the group is also planning attacks here in D.C. the day of Biden's inauguration. Threats also identified against Joe Biden, Kamala Harris and Nancy Pelosi. D.C.'s mayor requesting that all large-scale public events be canceled until at least January 24th. The Secret Service official overseeing security for the inauguration says expect an army. You're going to see checkpoints. You're going to see barricades. You're going to see magnetometer screening um, through all aspects and points of the city. For what purpose does the gentleman from West Virginia rise? I object. House Republicans blocked a unanimous consent resolution urging Vice President Mike Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment and remove President Trump from office. The full House will vote on the resolution tomorrow. I like the 25th Amendment because it gets rid of him. He's out of office. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says if the vice president does not respond within 24 hours, Democrats will move forward with articles of impeachment accusing the president of inciting an insurrection. The warning was stark. Tonight, ABC News learning the day before the riots, the FBI's Norfolk, Virginia office sent out an internal bulletin raising the specter of growing calls for violence. One online thread stating, be ready to fight. Congress needs to hear glass breaking, doors being kicked in, and go there ready for war. We get our president or we die. FBI officials said today the intelligence was raw, did not name specific individuals, and was shared with officials in D.C. Sources saying the mob had leadership with communications equipment and military expertise. We're looking at significant 
felony cases tied to sedition and conspiracy. People are going to be shocked with some of the egregious contact that happened within the Capitol. The FBI also releasing new images of the person suspected of planting those two pipe bombs, showing a distinctive backpack and shoes. And a new detail, the bombs were equipped with timers. Law enforcement chasing down more than 100,000 leads, simultaneously racing to disrupt any plans for violence on Inauguration Day. Capitol Police telling House Democrats overnight they're preparing for more than 10,000 armed Trump supporters to descend on the Capitol for the inauguration. Some reportedly planning to form perimeters around the Capitol complex, the White House, and the Supreme Court, blocking anyone who doesn't support Trump, perhaps assassinating them. And they have published rules of engagement, meaning when you shoot and when you don't. Today, officials arresting 45-year-old Louis Capriati of Chicago, who allegedly threatened to kill members of Congress in a voicemail saying, we will surround the blank White House. Concerned lawmakers suggesting all members of Congress go through metal detectors at the inauguration. Well, in the simplest terms, martial law means that the military has replaced the standing government. As such, the highest ranking military official becomes the head of state and the country's constitution, along with individual rights and freedoms, are suspended. Martial law is usually a response to a malicious, corrupt, or inefficient government and is imposed after a coup d'etat or political uprising. But in rarer instances, it can occur during a conflict or after a natural disaster when the state is particularly vulnerable. In the United States, martial law is directly linked to the writ of habeas corpus, which broadly speaking gives the judiciary the power to oversee law enforcement. When habeas corpus is suspended, the country is arguably in a state of martial law. This has only happened on a federal level once, when President Lincoln suspended habeas corpus during the Civil War. However, it has happened on a state or local level a number of times. For example, what is now the state of Hawaii was placed under martial law following the Pearl Harbor attack in World War II. The city of San Francisco has dealt with martial law twice, once after the 1906 earthquake and again in 1934 when the California governor responded to the dock workers strike by placing just the docks under martial law. General but Michael Flynn, his former national security advisor, shared a press release on Twitter. It was from We the People Convention, an Ohio-based nonprofit announcing they took out a full-page ad in the Washington Post. They urged Trump to declare a limited form of martial law and temporarily suspend the Constitution and civilian control of the elections. They say it'd be for the sole purpose of having the military oversee a national re-vote. The founders created three branches of government to limit the abuse of power. But what happens when the chief executive can bypass all of that and make monumental decisions for the country completely on his own? It's called a national emergency. Legal scholars identify more than 100 powers the president has access to once he declares a national emergency. Many would be considered illegal under other circumstances. They are broad and can be used even if they don't relate to the emergency at hand. With one announcement, the president can freeze bank accounts or even shut down electronic communications inside the United States. Some of these laws were created nearly a century ago when access to technology was minimal. What wasn't such a big deal back then could be a disaster today. The president also has broad power when it comes to our armed forces. He can essentially deploy troops whenever, wherever. This includes right here within the borders of our country. The president can deploy the military to act as a domestic police force uh, in order to suppress insurrections, unlawful combinations, conspiracies or domestic violence um, that in his view are obstructing or opposing the execution of federal law. He's only supposed to declare a national emergency when there is an immediate threat to the country and getting anything through Congress could take too long. Not to sort of short circuit the political process and give the president the power to sort of act as a dictator. In theory, it should be a situation that's, a, a, that's totally unexpected, um, that could not have been predicted, that is just a total departure from the norm, something that's different than, than everything else, and uh, something that's moving so quickly that uh, Congress really can't uh, act uh, quickly enough, and the president needs more flexibility during that time period. That's what an emergency should be. The guardrails on these powers are almost none. 
The Constitution doesn't give details about how to handle them, so many believe they're at the president's discretion. The Supreme Court has supported the president's actions for the most part. Congress, on the other hand, has attempted to check this power, but hasn't exactly followed through. They laid out a few rules for the president. First, they say a national emergency should only last one year. They want the president to tell them which powers he's going to use and give them updates on progress every six months. From that. FDR did it when he interned Japanese Americans during World War II. President Bush declared one after 9-11 with armed forces. And President Obama declared a national emergency because of swine flu. The better way. To unleash the full power of the federal government in this effort today, I am officially declaring a national emergency. Two very big words. The action I am taking will open up access to up to $50 billion 